All right, six o'clock, we'll get started. Hello, I'm Hunter. I am the Director of Telecommunications and Connectivity for the Public Service Department. And this is our public listening section for VSA 248A. So tonight we have Harley with us. I'll allow her to introduce herself. I'll take the mic. mic, you can just talk. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Harley Cuero. I'm the Telecommunications Coordinator with the Public Service Department. So thank you all for coming. The reason that we're here tonight is to talk about 248A um, and to get your input on potential changes you would like to see to make the process easier to engage with. So the reason we're doing these is back in, I think it was May, the legislature passed H110, which was the extension of 248A, which is the statute which dictates cell tower sightings within the state of Vermont. It's one of the ways 248, or I'm um, sorry, uh, Act 250 is the other, but 248A is the most prominent way that cell towers are sited within the state. So every three years it sunsets, and every three years the legislature passes a, another bill which extends the sunset out three more years. This year when they passed the bill to extend out the sunset, they passed a provision which said the Public Service Department would seek input from municipalities, the utilities, and the public on ways to make the process more accessible. So. That's why we're here. That's what we're hoping to accomplish with this meeting. In general, I have a short presentation on what 248A is, just to kind of level set, so we all have some idea of what the statute entails. And then it's just a public comment session. Harley will take notes. After I get through the presentation, I'll give her her computer back so she doesn't have to write in a pencil. And then we'll take these notes and we'll put them together. And on or before Jan January 15th, <laughs> we will present our report back to the legislature. And what they do with it is up to them. I can't dictate that. But what I can do is make sure that the comments and the feedback that you give us during this process is given to them and we let them know what your opinion is on this statute. So what is 248A? There's three major players in the 248A process. Those are considered the three Ps. There's a Public Utilities Commission, which is the PUC, the Public Service Department, which Harley and I represent, and the petitioners. The Public Utilities Commission, if any of you have dealt with the PUC, the PUC is an independent quasi-judicial agency that regulates the utilities in the state of Vermont. I read that part because that's kind of written into exactly who they are within the state. They operate a lot like a court. I don't know if any of you have ever been to court, but they conduct evidentiary hearings, issue decisions that they refer to as orders. They establish rules and procedures related to utility matters. And then when they come to a final decision, they either issue or deny the petition from the party seeking it in the form of a certificate of public good. The Public Service Department, so who Harley and I represent, we represent the public interest in proceedings before the PUC, generally relating to electricity, telecommunications, and cable companies. So we are the regulatory authority for these agencies. We're the ones who actually can regulate them in the event that something needs to happen and we need to step in. And then there's the applicants or the petitioners. So the applicants can initiate the 248 proceedings by filing an application with the PUC. They are the parties to the proceedings and must represent their interests before the Public Utilities Commission. And typically in the state of Vermont, it's either the telecommunication providers or tower builders who are the ones that issue the, or the ones that submit the 248A petitions to the Public Utilities Commission. So some of the considerations that are taken during the sitting of these telecommunication towers. So the PUC considers many factors when choosing a site. This is uh, including but not limited to the availability of the host property. There needs to be a place to put the tower. Access to utilities, you know, if you just have a spot in the middle of a field, it doesn't do much good. You need to get power and fiber optic backhaul. The ability to meet the service coverage goals, which generally means how many people will the tower cover if it's erected and then the ability to co-locate equipment on existing structures. So that means that if you have a tower 50 feet away, the chances are you're not gonna get approved to put another tower up right next to it. If there's an existing structure, we try to encourage co-location as much as possible. Most of the time when there's concerns with these, they're resolved prior to the application actually being submitted. 
I think, uh, I'm not sure if that was the case in Worcester, if these were resolved prior to the application during the notice period, but I've seen that happen in other places where the utility will have a meeting with the town before they even submit the application. And basically the grievances will be aired and then the utility will decide whether or not to actually proceed with the application. So this is a brief overview of the three types of 248A projects that we have. We have a de minimis modification, limited size and scope, and then a full 248A project. So the de minimis is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's the smallest type. In general, it involves adding a antenna or an attachment to a tower or a silo. There's some height restrictions related to how big the tower and some restrictions on how much um, surface area can be impacted. For instance, uh, can't increase the tower more than 300 feet. It can't increase it 10 feet for that particular application. It can't um, increase the aggregate surface area of the support structure by more than 75 square feet. So one of the takeaways from this is that there's no advance notice required for this type of project. The utility can go decide they want to do a min de minimis project and submit the application directly to the PUC. I would say 85% of all the applications we see at the Public Service Department are de minimis applications, and most of them entail an existing structure where the utility wants to go in and replace an antenna that's five years old with an antenna that's brand new or something along those lines. Objections to these must be filed within 30 days of the date of the application. So they, it gets submitted and there's 30 days where objections can be filed in case someone has an issue with one of these de minimis modifications. Limit in size and scope is the next one up. These can be for new projects, but they can't exceed 140 feet in total height. They must remain under 200 feet after project completion. They can't expand the width of the structure by more than 20 feet, and they can't disturb more than 10,000 square feet of earth total. These applications require a 60-day advance notice period prior to the application submission. Within 60 days of the application going in to the PUC, it's expected that the Public Utilities Commission will make a determination. Um, in the event the application raises a significant issue, the Public Utilities Commission has 90 days to issue their final order. And then the full 248A project. These are big new communication pieces of infrastructure. We don't see very many of these. In fact, I've been with the department, I think, seven or eight months now, and I have yet to see one of these come through for a full project. There's no height or size limitations on these. The PUC must make a finding that the project will not have undue adverse effect on specific criteria, and it requires 60 days of advance notice for this project type. Um, the PUC is expected to make their decision within 60 days, and if a significant issue is raised, then they're expected to make their final decision within 180 days of this application. So, undue adverse effects. I think this is probably why a lot of people come to these and what people consider. One of the sticking points is these are the issues or these are the adverse effects that the PUC will, will look at when they decide whether or not to issue a certificate of public goods. So they can issue a CPG for a project if the following have not been violated. Aesthetics, historic sites, air and water purity, natural environment, public health and safety, and the public use and enjoyment of 89 and 91, and any highway designated as a scenic corridor or a scenic road. There's additional criteria written in the statute, but I didn't copy it all down. If you're interested, all the Vermont statute is online. It's, it's not too difficult to find. If you need help, um, let us know, and I'd be happy to send it to you. So what happens if there is a significant issue raised during a 248A proceeding? There is, and this is where the quasi-judicial nature of the PUC kicks in. There's a pre-hearing conference, which is going to, it's decided how the case will be managed. There's discovery around the petition. There's an evidentiary hearing, and then the final decision is issued by the PUC. Parties can appeal the decisions that the Public Utilities Commission makes all the way up to the Vermont Supreme Court. I don't know if folks realize that. But that's a final authority. So ways to participate in this process. Towns and cities can participate in the following three ways. There is a right to request a public meeting with the applicant and the public service department. So during that 60-day notice period, the town can request a public meeting, and the PSD will consider the comments and recommendations when it makes its recommendation to the Public Utilities Commission. 
They can submit comments and recommendations directly to the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we'll go over that in the next slide on exactly how that's done. And then they can file a right to intervene in the proceedings and become a formal party in the case. So the comment process after the PUC receives a submission is um, any person wishing to file comments with the PUC is required to do so within the comment period. This is for de minimis, limited size and scope, and then a full 248 project. They have different comment periods. 30 days for de minimis, and I believe uh, longer for 248 for full projects and limited size and scope. Um, let's see, comments on the limited size and scope must be filed with EPUC by email to the clerk of the PUC or in paper form as long as there are not a motion to intervene in a request for a hearing. And the comments from an individual have to be filed in EPUC, which is the uh, online electronic system. That's it, I ran through it pretty quick because it's a very complex process and we could spend an hour and a half going into the minutia of it. But I wanted to give you folks an opportunity to ask questions and uh, to get your input on how you potentially think this could be made easier to participate in. And I'm going to give Harley back her computer now so she doesn't have to use pencil to take notes. All right, it's your meeting. Yes, sir. So what's your sense about how a, uh, a regular citizen can get standing to uh, uh, address the PUC? I'm unsure. I wish we had one of the lawyers here. <laughs> I'm unsure if a regular citizen can file for standing as a PUC or if a town or municipality can. I can figure that out and get back to you. I know that the town or municipality has the ability to file to be a party within the, uh, within the case, but I don't know if a non-adjoining landowner has a right to do that. I would have to look that up and get back to you. I think it's difficult. Um, and that's, that, that you can go on. We're, we got an hour and 15 minutes. Let's, yeah. let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, well, it would, just, it would just seem as though uh, it would be beneficial to uh, members of the PUC to hear uh, what folks in the community think about a, a given uh, a proposed a structure or, uh, or, or some alteration by de minimis or or such, uh, that would seem to be something that they would want to hear, yet it's nearly impossible for regular citizens, that is, non-adjoining uh, uh, landowners or town officials, to get standing to address the PUC. So it would just seem to, to clean that up would be, unless they don't want to hear from people, but I don't think that's the case. No, I don't think that's the case. So if I was to phrase that as a suggestion to put in this report, it would be increased, let's see, how can we phrase that? Make it easier for regular citizens to be able to address the PUC, that is to get standing or not have standing, but still be able to address something. Right. So a, an easier public comment mechanism for private or personal interested parties to comment to the PUC. Does that summarize it? Is that, is that okay? I can add that, I'm, I won't quote that, but I'll take this away as one of the themes that we got at this meeting was uh, the request for easier comment for, P for individuals on PUC cases. If you do have a comment, I just wanna put this out there. If anyone has a comment that they would like me to copy verbatim from an email into this report, please just email it to us. And that way I can guarantee I'm not misquoting you. And I'm also not taking away the, the wrong general idea. If you must send me an email, I plan on making an addendum to this report, which includes all the comments I received electronically, and I will cut and paste it in there directly. And then you can be guaranteed what you had to say makes it into the report. But I think I understand what you're saying. I don't disagree. I think that a mechanism to make it easier for the public in general to provide comments to the PUC on their feelings around any particular sighting would be useful. I think that would definitely encourage participation.
Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, ma
that we, we were looking for feedback, so I said, okay, if, if there's sort of some suggestions, I would have. So, so but let me shoot. Uh, the first thing is sort of what you're talking about is time. Uh, the 60 day advance notice period is. It is inadequate. The, the applicants uh, have uh, months to prepare these things, and they are already very um, familiar with and uh, practiced in the process. So, uh, in our case, and, and I'm from Worcester, and there was a tower proposed for Worcester uh, two years ago. And, uh, and when when the town was alerted to this tower coming to town, we uh, didn't really have any idea what that meant. Uh, what's more, we had an ordinance that uh, said you couldn't build a tower that was more than 20 feet taller than the surrounding uh, crown of trees. Um, so we thought that it couldn't happen because we had problems. Anyway, that, we discovered that was uh, inaccurate. But uh, it took us 60 days to even understand what was going on. So that 60-day uh, advance notice period, I think, is just wholly inadequate, I would think a, a more reasonable time would be 180 days. Uh, because it's, uh, that gives the town a chance to sort of catch its breath. And for a town like Worcester, where we have a volunteer select board and, 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 and no town man, everything's volunteer. Uh, no full-time attorney. You have to scramble to figure out what's going on. Okay. So, so would you would you would you like to see 180 days on all the types, or do you have different date thresholds for the different types, or do you just? No, I, I would think de minimis could be shorter, but the limited the limited scale still 140 feet is a big tower. Most trees around are, are 70 feet tall, so that's still going to be 70 feet above. Canopy trees. In our case, the tower proposed in our town is 198.6 feet. So that's 130 feet above the canopy of trees. Uh, Wait, before you move on, can I just add something to that part? Please. So you described the DPS as being the regulatory body. So, so in this process of the 60 day, it didn't, that if you look, read the 248A, how the process should work, it doesn't sound that bad. But in our case, at least in Worcester, the whole process felt like it was slaughtered and nobody liked the regulatory body, which maybe would have been the DPS, spoke up about that. For example, when the, the proposal dropped on us, and it said, please call this number for if you have questions. The person at that number was on permanent vacation for well, was three for weeks or four weeks or something. So there was nobody. I mean, we did try to talk to somebody. There was nobody to talk to. That was right on the edge of Christmas. So then the holidays started. So already we're like four weeks into the, the 60 days and we have not been able to reach anybody or talk to anyone. So the applicant is, is charged with providing the town with certain information, like propagation maps and uh, surveys that they've done. How many phone calls, that was, that was not forthcoming at the beginning, many phone calls to get those maps. And when they finally came, again, normal human beings reading propagation maps was kind of impossible. Fortunately, we have an electrical engineer in the family, so we could find one and, and understand it. And what we learned by understanding them, that they were totally incomplete. There was nothing that was there that was allowed us to compare what they were proposing to what is. So on every level, 
our information was adequate, the timing was inadequate, we had nobody to turn to, and there wasn't anybody from the regulatory body that seemed to be holding the applicants speak to the fire on it. So I guess my comment would be, what is the role of the regulatory body and can they work for both sides? So I'm going to quote statute and say the public service department represents the public interest in 248A proceedings. I said I've been here seven months. I apologize. I did follow that case. I watched all the um, hearings on YouTube. I'm the new Clay Purvis. Yeah, I took over for Clay. So if we can kind of change that into a suggestion I can include in this report, it sounded like the first part was that some of the information that you would have wanted to see in the original application was difficult to get. So. Yes. And complete. And readable. So I can do timely and complete, but I can't make anybody a telecommunications engineer. Propagation maps are hard to read even for me at times. So I can, uh, I can do timely, complete, and readable, but I can't guarantee readable. But what I can do is I can put in a comment that says, we got feedback that, when would you like that information included? Or would you, I can say easier to get, but that's kind of a generic comment. The application or with the drugs. That's right. It's sort of like when the application is, is uh, when that, that, that leads to my next. Hold on. I want to I get this buttoned up and then this, this ma'am had her hand up. The 60 days is short. Uh, we were also faced with a situation where. Uh, just in the holidays. And so we lost weeks in the process. It, as I understand, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but that's not uncommon, it turns out. Right. That, well, it's delivered. It's delivered. So we've got longer notice period. You get that? And then it sounded like uh, required information included with the initial application or at the beginning of the notice period? Yes. I think that that was what you were getting at. Good. So uh, number two, I, 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 I consider collaboration. It seems to me um, that mandated and enforced collaboration between municipalities, state officials, and developers should happen before siting and design are finalized. So the developer wants to come to Worcester and build a tower. That person should come and work together with the town to figure out where the best place to build is and what the best kind of tower to build is so that that can be a collaborative effort so the towns aren't always angry. I, I think that when you're building a, a big tower, which even a 140-footer, which is not big as compared to what was proposed in our time, virtually all towns fight these things. If it's a de minimis thing, like you said, 85% or more are not fought. But they're almost all fought if they're big. And so to make that whole process be not such an onerous situation, it's far better to get the town, the municipality, to buy in on this right from the get-go. It seems to me. Uh, I agree. How do we? And, and maybe a way to, to handle that, I said, uh, so between municipality, state officials, and the applicant, and maybe the state officials could be sort of some sort of an ombudsman provided by the PUC to sort of help the municipalities through this process, recognizing that they are virtually all common to Pansco when this sort of thing happens to that town. So help the towns through it so the town feels like the state is helping me. I'm not all alone here. I can sort of understand the process. It makes it we make it so much easier. There are people in the state who are very, very helpful. Don't charge anything. But they're way overworked. And um, and I can't 
can't quite imagine how long they can do what they're doing. But without some of those people, I think little communities like ours would be absolutely uh, unable to react. So. Okay, so it sounds like there was two takeaways from that. One was the abutment. Did you get that? the PUC or the PST to provide an interface to municipalities in the 248A projects where they could kind of have a go-to. And then the other piece... The other thing is that... ...was a collaboration. How do we... Collaboration between the town, the state, and the applicant uh, to uh, work on this before siting and design of the tower is completed or contemplated. So, so far in my limited experience, what I have been told is one of the hardest things for utilities to find in terms of siting a tower is a willing landowner who has property in a position that's going to offer a wide amount of coverage. So I've made this suggestion elsewhere internally. I think it would be in the public's best interest if the public service department kind of took the helm and tried to act as a middleman to connect people with land to utilities. And I think you're saying you would like to make sure that the town is also involved in that so that it's, a, it's all three. It's the siter, it's the landowner, and the town before a tower goes in. And I don't think, maybe this is me just being idealistic, I don't think the utilities want to put towers in where they're not wanted. The utilities don't want to force their way in necessarily. They want to go and find people who are willing participants in towns who want their service. But I do agree that there's that disconnect between those three parties, between the landowner, the municipality, and the utility in terms of siting needs. And I think that's often what leads to some of the conflict when these, these come up. I wish I shared your optimism about these tower companies. I'm, I'm still naive, so. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I hope maybe things have changed in the last two years, but, uh, but that, that, was not, uh, that was not our response. That was no. Anyway, my third suggestion is that uh, environmental and health risks need to be contemplated. The uh, 96, 1996 Telecommunications Act uh, prevents the evaluation of telecom towers and radio frequency radiation based on environmental effects of our uh, emissions. Now, the Telecommunications Act is based on 30-year-old science, at least 30 years old, or likely 40 or such. I'm a retired ER physician. If I were treating a heart attack patient with 30-year-old science, I don't think anybody would want themselves or members of their family treated with that kind of care. Likewise, I don't think that people in the state of Vermont want the evaluation of RFR to come from 30 or 40 year old science. They want it to come from science that is evolving and is much, much more recent. And the overwhelming weight of recent studies show that at the very least, uh, we need to be concerned about the safety of the RFR. So it seems to me that the state has a responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens. And uh, if it does, it does not evaluate this recent literature, it is not doing that. And so at the very least, it seems to me that the state should uh, develop a commission to evaluate the environmental and health effects of RFR, as was done in the state of New Hampshire. So I'll say that we, 
in Vermont are federally preempted from making decisions based on the health impacts or potential health impacts of RF radiation, so we are not allowed to take that into account in any of our decision-making process. I have heard similar comments from other folks during this, and I think we can say that this was echoed here where the public would like to see the state take a lead in doing something in terms of investigation of the potential health impacts of RF radiation. Yeah, I understand that you are, you are, uh, you're preempted. Uh, federal law preempts, state law, state law preempts, municipal law, I get that. But when federal law is so obviously outdated and unwilling to even look at new information, at some point you have to stand up and say, this is just nuts. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, I, I think that there, there's a lot of information out there. And it's just that the preponderance of the thousands of articles that exist in evaluating RFI, the preponderance it shows that there are big concerns, big concerns. and. As a state, we, we we can't stick our head in the sand, and that's exactly what we're doing. That's what all, almost all the states are doing, because no one uh, wants to buck the, the FCC. It's, it's as simple as that. We will make sure that makes it in there. It's the best I can do. I can't I can't tell them to to do the study, but I do understand your concern, and I can make sure that your comment is passed on up to the legislature. Thank you. individual can input a comment into the EPUC system during a sighting, during a 248A sighting. Um, do you mean somehow have standing above and beyond the comment, just the public comment period? And I guess it would depend on, I'm not exactly sure how to make that happen. I know that the abutting landowner, you know, they're an interested party, but if your strip of land is only 50 feet wide or 100 feet wide because you're on a small building plot, then the next land over, the next piece is not necessarily abutting and falls under a different set of rules. Um, how big would you like to see that sphere increased, I guess would be a question. So we can try to formulate how to put this into the statute. I, I just put it out there that there are people impacted who have no way of, of weighing in other than to make a comment. So something along the lines of maybe increase the impacted area for for impacted landowners or individuals 
Is that kind of sum up? Yeah, but I guess that my point is it's not just the, the, the budding landowners right, I'm, impacted by a project. Right, I'm trying to think of how to word it to impact. Probably 20, 15, 15 homes that were impacted uh, visually or distance-wise. I think I got the general theme, increase the distance as opposed to just the abutment for impacted people. I can come up some more uh, more articulate when I'm not standing up here. The, the, um, this gentleman spoke to that, that I think is important is that, you know, if there's a, there's a what kind of to a situation like that, I don't have the information that, that the public utility that the that AT&T has or the, you know, whoever it is, the applicant. Um, I don't have that information. And so is there a way that people like me can get support in understanding the process and um, making my standing or my opinion known? The only way that we were able to do it was to hire a lawyer. That's pretty expensive. My neighbor stood to gain. I spent a lot of money. My neighbor stood to gain. And, and so that just seems unjust. Is there a way that the Public Service Board can help represent the common citizens? Or I think we... Ray, we've we've gotten similar comments um, in terms of easier participation for the public and for municipalities. We can definitely say that that was echoed again. Um, I think one of the suggestions that had come in was related to offering kind of the crash course that other people had spoke to for municipalities. That one came in in writing, maybe from you. I don't know. <laughs> so that's been echoed a couple times as well. But are you suggesting some sort of kind of public information along with the lines of what we're doing here, but less public input and more with the Public Service Department or the Public Utilities Commission kind of coming in and explaining the minutia of the 248A process to towns. Is there a way that you could provide that information so that the common citizen who's impacted by a project like this understands the process? Yeah, I, I personally will provide anything you ask me to. If you email me at hunter.thompson at vermont.gov, I am happy to give you all the information and explain it to the best of my ability, which is mostly right sometimes. But no, I know what you mean. But, I, but it was a it was, it was a, it was a kind of search for where do I learn about this? Okay, so easier access to information about 248A. Are you okay with that being on the website or being published in electronic format or even YouTube videos, or whatever the case may be? Understand. You, you mentioned that the um, in the topic here, um, that maybe there's a place for uh, a different kind of you see hearing perhaps on that I mean I've heard some people say maybe there should be an open hearing where instead of having all this done by email and, uh, and sort of deposition like things that then it goes to the PUC and they meet in the dark room somewhere and review all this stuff uh, that there's actually an open hearing where people can speak can uh, rebut things that are um, presented, so uh, maybe that's a better idea. So if that was the case, do you see that being led by the Public Utilities Commission or by the municipality? Well, I, I think, or? I, think it, I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that this would happen when uh, provider um, has filed for a tower to be built, for example, they've gone through the 60-day period and then the 30-day, whatever, I can't remember what that's called, a response period or something, and then, and now it goes to the PUC, so now there's a hearing, and rather than 
gathering all this stuff sent in by electronic mail of some sort. Um, that there's actually a hearing where people sit down in a room, the PUC sits behind the desk, wears little black coats, and, uh, and, and, and there, you know, it's a period of some like thing. I mean, there's this accountability of people that, that are saying, we're not so excited about this problem. Uh, and so people talk, and the town would say, everyone in your town loves it. And the town says, well, that's not exactly right. You know, so you can actually rebut what's said. I mean, is that a possibility, do you think? I can make sure to suggest it. So a uh, public hearing with the PUC for any application that has a significant issue raised. I think that's it, right? To me, that, that that's a lot more transparent. What, we're, what you're asking for, whatever we're asking for is, make the whole process transparent. Let's get this out into the open. And the way the PUC acts now, as I understand it, we didn't go to the PUC, thankfully. It stopped before that. But it seems to me that uh, that's the most transparent way of having this sort of thing occur. Yeah, there's kind of a strange juxtaposition there when you have that advance notice period and you have that public hearing but the PUC is not directly involved yet because a petition has not been submitted to the PUC so you have this kind of I don't want to say good faith public hearing because a public hearing is is done but the PUC is not really it's not an application or it's not a petition yet, so the PUC isn't involved so potentially doing that sort of same public hearing after the petition is in place and the PUC is involved, but on the other, the flip side of that is that, uh, as you've seen in case with the Worcester Tower as well as the other tower that was withdrawn during the public comment period, if it can be resolved before going to the PUC, it saves having to go through that quasi-judicial process. So I'm not sure how to circle that square, but I do know, ex I know what you're saying. I just don't have a good answer yet, I apologize. I mean, the, we had, a public, uh, we had a public meeting. It wasn't a hearing, it was a meeting where uh, the, uh, where the town talked about what was going on and then we invited the tower people to come and they talked about what the, they saw what was going on. And, and then I, I saw several other uh, similar hearings uh, that had been uh, uh, recorded on video from other towns around the state, and I um, and and so you can sort of see how these things were presented. And in many of those hearings, you sort of heard uh, uh, suggestions by the applicants, and you kind of question. Uh, how, how straightforward some of the suggestions in it were. Um, anyway, that's why it, was, it would seem to me that it when, it came, when it went beyond that to the a PUC hearing, that that could be an open, an open meeting. That would be, I think, a good thing. We will definitely include that as a suggestion. I don't disagree. Yeah. Thanks. I'm just listening. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm just listening. I'm going to stand up here for another 40 minutes. So <laughs> you guys are all welcome to stay. You know, you could, you could sit down. I guess uh, I can ask a question. I missed the first two minutes coming in here. Um, can you review the municipal responsibility in this process again proposed process uh, what do you mean responsibility um, I know they're a party but um, do they have an official role responsibility and so I don't believe I don't believe they have an official responsibility I think responsibility implies that they're are required to participate and in more than one occasion these applications will be submitted 
approved and the certificate of public good will be issued with no involvement from anybody from individuals or from municipalities but municipalities do have a right to um to participate so while it's not our responsibility they do have a right to participate and i know i find the slide <laughs> So, towns and cities may participate in the following three ways. Um, the municipality has a right to request a public meeting with the applicant and the public service department. So, during the 60-day comment period, or 60-day notice period, rather, the host town can request a public meeting, and the PSD will consider comments and recommendations to the Public Utilities Commission. The town can submit their comments or recommendations directly to the Public Utilities T Commission. They can either file those electronically through the EPUC system or in writing or um, via email to the clerk, which is actually just, uh, I think, uh, what is it, clerk.puc at vermont.gov, pretty easy email. And then they can file a right to intervene and become a, a, a formal party in the proceeding. but I don't believe they have that responsibility. They're not forced to. That's a choice that they make, and if they decide to make it, those are the three avenues that they can they can pursue for these type of uh, applications. I'm not sad the mic died. <laughs> All right, I'll be here, but you guys are welcome to stay. Keep talking to me. I don't know if you're gonna keep recording, just me sitting around. Can you just close the meeting? I announced it till 7.30, so I'm not gonna close it officially till 7.30, but like I said, it's gonna be Harley and I sitting around here. So if you feel like wandering back in, do so. Uh, I'd love to talk to you after, as a citizen, as opposed to my role in the public service department. So thank you all for attending. We will do our best to make sure that your comments and themes are included in our report. And again, if you have anything you would like copied and pasted so that you can ensure that I didn't misrepresent what was said, please send it to me in an email and I will copy and paste it directly out of your email into our report to the legislature. On the screen, I added our department, our division's email, so myself, Aaron Rosser, who's not here with us tonight, he is our project manager, and Eric Hunter will receive that email. So any questions, all three of us will get a few percent to this one. Great. Thank you all.